Um, I'd like to talk today about the Health Enhancement Programme, or what we call the HEP, which is a resilience building course that we hope, which we haven't started yet, but we hope to roll out for our first year medical students when the new curriculum starts in 2016 and, there, and, and thereafter. So it's come about because Prof London, who's the head of the medical education department, has recognised a decrease in resilience of medical students and junior doctors in recent years, or perhaps over the last decade, and he wants to introduce mindfulness um, um, to promote resilience among students and junior doctors. I think he'd agree with this um, Australian study which showed that about 28% of medical students have burnout in the middle of their final year. It's a demanding course. I know a lot of our students, I've worked in pastoral care for about 12 years before I stepped out recently, and a lot of them are very anxious, very depressed. A lot of them are on SSRIs. Um, and about 75% of interns have burnout in, the, in about eight months into their inter in the first job. doesn't mean they don't continue and become doctors, but it is very stressful for them and we lose some of them. Indeed, after the second year, I think we lose 25% of all our graduates. That doesn't mean we leave, lose them forever to medicine, but we, they go away and we don't know where they go. Some of them go to <coughs> Australasia, some of them take a year out, some just disappear. Um, we're most familiar with our GPs, I think. What we don't know is that the average age of retirement amongst UK female GPs is 34. That doesn't mean you won't find a female GP older than that, but that's the average age of retirement in the UK. Many of our older GPs, those who work nearly a week, are now retiring, so there's a big tranche of them leaving. And new GPs rarely work more than three day a week. Um, so most deaneries are experiencing shortfall in uptake whoops, of GP um, training posts. And that situation is a complex one and not just down to student stress. But the stress is a big factor and certainly I think in why most new GPs rarely find they can achieve a work-life balance without working more than, um, if they work more than three days a week. Um, Shapiro et al and many others have looked at um, stress management programs for medical students and identified a whole raft of improvements that seem to result. Um, and I think you could argue that any one of these would make it more likely that a med student would get through their course and that a, uh, uh, and that a medic would sustainably uh, 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 keep working throughout a career. Um, one way of approaching stress management is through this very topical subject. You've probably opened a colour supplement and come across articles on mindfulness. One way is to introduce mindfulness as a stress reduction programme. And worldwide, about 14 medical schools now teach mindfulness. Um, um, two medical and, and dental students and residents and so on, which isn't many out of the hundreds of medical s schools in the country, nor is it um, part of the core curriculum in all those 14 places. But nevertheless, it's a start, and it shows that people are taking mindfulness seriously for their medical students. Well, what is it? It's, it's a bit hard to describe what mindfulness is. Really, you've got to practice it to understand it, and those of you who have will have some notion of what it's about. Um, but first of all, it's, it's primarily not a relaxation exercise. Relaxation is a frequent side effect, but not necessarily the primary goal. Um, John kabat who's used it for over 30 years in the States for chronic pain relief with his patients, cool, uh, just, uh, defines it as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment. In other words, not thinking about the past, not thinking about the future particularly most of the time and non-judgmentally. You could say it's all about attention regulation, to know where your attention is at any given moment, to be able to prioritise where it needs to be, and for the attention to go there and stay there. Um, so a Harvard study came up with a sort of surprising conclusion, which you might feel inclined to disagree with, but they published it in Science. In conclusion, a human mind is a wandering mind, and a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. The ability to think about what is not happening, not happening right here and now, is a cognitive achievement that comes at an emotional cost, and that emotional cost is seen time and time again in our medical students. William James, the father of American psychology, wrote back in 1890, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again, what mindfulness tries to train you one to do, is the very root of judgment, character and will. No one is compass sui if you have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. So Prof wants us to introduce mindfulness to the curriculum rather than um, generate something with our limited experience de novo, 
we thought we'd look around at what there is around the world. And the one we like is this, the Health Enhancement Program, which was introduced 13 years ago as a compulsory accessible course at Monash Medical School in Melbourne for medics. It had been an elective course for a good decade before that, but it's now actually met with considerable approval and is delivered across campus there. Um, its author is uh, Craig Hassid, who's a GP and senior lecturer. He's rather found himself a rather unhappy first-year medical student and seems to be one of these rare people who arrived at mindfulness on his own sitting in a chair somewhere, but quickly found that it's embedded in all the ancient major world faith traditions or wisdom traditions and in the last 20 years found an increasing scientific evidence base supporting the benefits of mindfulness. He's published widely in the field of general practice because he is a general practitioner but also on mindfulness, mindfulness for life. This book particularly interesting actually mindful learning for anyone who's a student I think it's really encouraging and for anyone who's an educator. So to get back to the health enhancement program what is it? Well, it's a stress release program, which is mindfulness based, and that's embedded in what they call the Essence program, which is a modified lifestyle program. And Essence stands for these seven, if you like, pillars of health things that it's um, that, that Craig Acid believes underpin health. We need to get these things right if we're to have well-being, if we're to be healthy. Medical students need these if they're to complete the course and be um, doctors who can work for an entire career. So there's the stress management there as the first S of essence. Um, education comes throughout. The stress management is the longitudinal theme throughout the whole thing. It's felt to underpin it. But other things like spirituality, finding meaning, exercise, nutrition, connectedness, environment, all important and all taught through lectures and crucially through experiential learning in tutor group sessions. Um, so, so in the tutor groups, all these things are, are, are discussed and referred to. Students set themselves tasks along these, uh, having had the teaching on exercise and nutrition or whatever, they'll set themselves tasks on exercise, and I'm going to catch the bus twice, um, walk twice a week instead of catching the bus. They'll discuss those in subsequent tutorials. And the idea is that any, any benefits of those things are spread and, and shared among students to their benefit, and, and refractoriness as well, the inability even though you know something's really good for you to do it, it's also a good thing to share because it teaches students how refractory we are as human beings, how refractory their patients can be, how perhaps they'll have more empathy for their patients having themselves failed repeatedly to fulfill some of their tasks. So there are the, there are the tutorials, six of them, and there's more influence in green there just to show that's the longitudinal theme throughout. So they'll practice some mindfulness. It's not compulsory to practice mindfulness. Somehow there's something wrong about forcing anyone to practice <laughs> mindfulness. But it's, it, but it's there, and students just agree not to disrupt other students who want to do that or who want to discuss it. And the course is compulsory, and the, the sort of um, factual component of it, if you like, is assessed to drive learning, to keep engagement. Um, so what's happened? Well, the 2006 cohort was studied at Monash, and about 90% of students personally applied the strategies they were taught. Their well-being was measured with a fairly detailed questionnaire at time one. That was before the course perhaps halfway through the first semester, and then again at time two after the HEP course, um, and shortly before exams when you normally find that students' stress levels and so on are going up, their well-being levels are falling. Actually, all the measures improved slightly, and I've got a busy slide, but if you just look at this column, all these numbers are lower than these numbers, and really that's showing that well-being on all these um, nine um, um, measures um, was improving. All, uh, not all of them significantly, but all of them improving. Some are uh, rarely above 30%, often only by about 10, 15, 20%, but nevertheless moving in the right direction over a fairly short period of time and perhaps encouraging one to continue this into, a, into the medical course. 2013, Monash medical students, last, large increases in their dispositional mindfulness, increases in their study engagement as measured by the Utrecht um, Work Engagement Scale and no increase again in depression, anxiety or stress just before exams compared to how they were shortly after they came. So it's been actually mindfulness as I say, it's, in, it's, it's, it's a very topical subject, you always worry about it being too popular and the pendulum going to swing back but it's, it's there in sport, we know that Djokovic took it up to improve his tennis, it's interesting neuroscience researchers it's got clinical applications and so on. Just as a little aside, here's Teasdale in Oxford. He found with people who had recurring depression 
that mindfulness-based cognitive therapy course, an eight-week course, reduced relapse from 78%, which is what you'd expect with normal medication and normal treatment, to 36%. And that's partly why, that and other studies, why our, our own National Institute of Clinical Excellence recommends mindfulness for those who've had three or more depressive episodes. If a drug produced that sort of effect, it would be hailed to the skies and millions of dollars would be being earned from it. But there it is in nice anyway. And I hope students, uh, Craig, Craig really plugs home. I, I, I think when you teach students this, the experience around the world is, is, is or, or try to introduce mindfulness, is that 30% of students go for it like anything. 30% can take it or leave it, and 30% really don't like it, really don't want it. What Craig does is he, he, he um, comes up with the scientific evidence base very heavily right from the start, and it's big, it's heavy, it's sort of irrefutable. Uh, here's just a tiny bit of it. In, medit in mindfulness meditators, there's demonstrative thickening of the brain cortex regions associated with attention, self-awareness, and sensory processing, but to the sort of millimeter level. Um, and that's measurable. You can see these areas light up. These are the areas that we also use when we're learning. So that's encouraging for any students um, in terms of the mindfulness they engage with. So just to finish, how could the HEP increase the future employability of our first few minutes? Well, in lots of ways, but I think by promoting the ease of lifelong learning, by reducing burnout in their F1 years and beyond, uh, by promoting more empathic, attentive and effective clinical practice, and by lowering those things that tend to lead to gaps in careers or, or, or knock people right out of their career life, neuroticism, all sorts of psychological symptoms, experiential avoidance, and the sort of dissociation that we sometimes see. Mm -hmm. um, and there are leaves, except to say that Craig's teach, um, um, speaking at a public lecture this Thursday in Kendall's Lecture Theatre One, if you want to hear a much better explanation than I could ever give for what, he, what, he, um, what he's doing. Thank you. Thanks very, very much. I it's, it's really um, it's really encouraging to see, a, I suppose, a, a vision of resilience which ties it in with a, an ethic of self-care and care yeah. for others. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's really, really encouraging. Mm -hmm. and, and I've practiced mindfulness myself, and so can testify to it. Uh, it's been you know, an enormous help in dealing with the various terrors of the modern university. But, but I think that, um, I suppose, one of the potential critiques, not, not of mindfulness as such, but, but that some of the, maybe some of the stuff around mindfulness, could potentially be that it locates, um, you know, the individual as the person responsible for managing and coping, and potentially shifts um, emphasis away from some of the broader structural causes of, you know, stress and anxiety, and, and why various sectors like health, for example, are, are a real challenge for those working in them. And I so just wondered, wondered how, as as a practitioner, as someone who's clearly committed to sort of supporting students in developing these capacities, how do you, you know, how, how do you approach that balance between, you know, supporting an individual or a group of people to, to cope with a particular situation, but, but then sort of retaining that, I suppose, critical perspective on the broader context in which mm. those struggles emerge? Mm. Mm. Yeah, this one I've thought about a lot because, as I said, I was in pastoral care for 12 yeah. years now. Repeatedly, I saw things that that I felt we should be doing as a medical student for students, that not just putting the problem back on them, but saying, yeah. you know, this is something we haven't got right, perhaps we need to move for you. We need to move for this individual in this and, and treat them as an individual, not as someone to whom to apply the rules. So I see it very much as a synergy that, that I hope students through practicing mindfulness will be more aware, more aware of what isn't being done for them, yeah. actually, and, right. and have a clearer Im uh, vision of, of what they can legitimately ask for, um, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and that we, in turn, um, and certain members of staff in our training in mindfulness, are more likely to be compassionate in our view of students and to see it in a holistic way, and not just something they've got to do for themselves. I actually asked this, <laughs> Craig Massive, I think I remember asking him here last summer and saying, um, Craig, do you think at Monash students are being more cared for in a way? And uh, Prof London, who was on my right, immediately jumped down my throat and said, Jonathan, the thing is not that they feel cared for, it's that they care for themselves, you know. <laughs> and, that was the that and, and in a sense, he's right, you know, you know I can see, but, but actually, actually, two things are going on here. I've seen enormous help to students when a member of staff has just taken the time to listen to them and hear them 
that's the first step. And then perhaps to use whatever ability they have to put things right for them. John, I'm from the accessibility sector, but I mm. also work for the local deanery providing support for, for junior doctors. And one of the things I've noticed, and I think it links to the previous question with you, it's kind of about the culture of medicine, mm. is uh, the doctors I work with in the deanery are reluctant to access the support that's available to them until they're down to the last chance. Mm. They've failed the exam four mm. times and time will have mm. gone by. Mm. At which point it's much more difficult to support somebody effectively than mm. had you done so early or when uh, of the problem. And I, I wonder how much of that's about the, the disposition of the individual and how much of it's about the wider Mm. Mm. Um, I think within medicine, medics themselves say that there's a sort of ethos within medicine, we are copers, we're the doctors, we're, we are all people cope, you know, we take the hits, we, we carry mm. on, we keep the wards open, etc, etc, and of course, it's sort of admirable in the Victorian sort of way, but it, it's not, you know, it's not the case when it comes mm. down to, uh, and doctors admit that they themselves are particularly bad at recognising their own ill health mm. or seeing the early signs of it and doing anything about it. So it is a trait amongst doctors. They aim very high and, and they, they're not particularly aware of their own health. Which is what I say about mindfulness is one of the things it, try, it, it, it seems to raise is self-awareness, just mm. how you're feeling in your own body actually, just what's tense, what's, you know, what, yeah, and, and, and an awareness of what's going on. It would be intriguing to see whether sort of Long term, it, it promotes and a willingness to accept the need for support mm. at various points in one's career, mm. which seems lacking. Um, the current problem. There's a huge need for that, but, mm. but it needs an attitudinal change within the medical school too. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah. That's the medicine, the last, the yeah. very last, the last we remember that time. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm just thinking of some of the evidence that you presented, and it's really nice to see this actually putting the framework on an evidence-based um, study to back up mindfulness, because one of the concerns is that it's almost like a fashion mm. that's come in, and mm. I've, I've worked as a cognitive neuroscientist on motion for many, many years, and I've sort of seen the patterns go from CBT, mm. from ecological mm. to biofeedback, to, you know, and here one is think of mindfulness. Well, one of my concerns is that we put this evidence forward, but do we really understand it, and I guess my main question was, okay, you mentioned cortical thickening uh, for the students that practice mindfulness, but you also see this um, same level of cortical thickening for things like if you implemented a biofeedback mm -hmm. program. Um, and I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about you know, the controls and what the compass and what. Yeah, I'm no expert on that study. Okay. Um, if you want to know about it, do yeah. come on Thursday if you're free. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just beginning to learn myself. I think that Mindful Learning book would be a very good starting one. It has masses of references in it. It's heavily referenced. Mm -hmm. I could point you to another mindfulness document compiled by Craig Cassett. But I don't think it's saying, look, this is this is this is this is the way forward and the others aren't. There isn't overlap. Of course there's overlap. Yeah. There's gonna be huge overlap. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even mindfulness-based cognitive therapy really you can argue these two things arrive at the same thing. They're both a way of stepping away from your thoughts and saying, I'll, I'll not be ruled by this thing. I'm going to look at it objectively. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to stand away from myself or what I regarded formerly as myself, my thoughts. And, you know, both of them do that, don't they, in their different ways and arrive, arguably, at the same end point. So there is overlap. Okay, thank, thank you very much indeed. Sorry to carry on.